So <clears throat> I'm going to give a different kind of talk, uh, not uh, a specific paper, but uh, how I'm thinking about this particular problem. And this is the this is the thing that's guiding a lot of the research questions I've been working on for the last few years. So I call it the shackles of legacy, and it's going to have both positive and negative connotation to it. And so the, the first question I ask is, can you think of anything from the 1990s that we use today? So, uh, hold on. So nothing about our computing systems from 1990s is similar to what we do today. Everything, you can't even find any of these things here. Uh, similarly, this was like our first, uh, I remember having a television like this, and nobody has a television like this anymore. Uh, and of course, entertainment. We used to have entertainment like this, and today nobody can have the attention span of more than like six seconds. That's kind of the optimal type of entertainment that people consume today. So essentially, nothing that we had from 1990 uh, or beyond, essentially, exists today, except in what area? Crypto, right? Everything that is used today. So that's that's the point of this. That's what I'm worried. That's what I'm wondering about. Why is it that in every other aspect of our life, we're happy to move on, even when it involves very physical things that we actually have to buy and replace or throw away and whatnot. Uh, but when it comes to things like these algorithms and these set of algorithms I'm going to talk about today, uh, we're somehow shackled to our legacy. And what does that mean for cryptographers? We keep on inventing new things and coming up with other ways of doing stuff. Are we basically fighting some force that we'll never overcome? Or is it a different mindset that we need to take about how we do research? And then, in fact, that's kind of what I've been thinking about recently. So uh, with that, uh, hold on, let me move this to, oh, it's okay. So I'm going to first spend the first uh, part of this talk. Uh, I, I heard several versions of this story. So I actually looked it up and figured out my own interpretation of what happened here. So <clears throat> here is a paper from uh, Chom et al. from YourCrypt87. And I think it's the first recorded version of this idea. Uh, the paper is called Demonstrating Possession of Discrete uh, Logarithms and Generalizations. And if you look at this protocol, it looks very familiar to stuff we're doing today, right? So. Uh, so you, you have A, B, and N here. This is all like in the discrete log sense, not in the elliptic curve sense today. But essentially, you're repeating something t times. You're sending over this alpha to the r. And then there's a challenge, which is a bit, a 0 or 1 bit. And essentially, you send back the linear combination right there. So that, that should be very familiar to all people who've studied cryptography. This is like the basic idea. And it's from 1987. What strikes me as odd, though, uh, is, OK, so David, Chom, and all, they're repeating this t times, and they're only sending a one-bit challenge. So this idea is in the air, because by 1989 here, uh, Schnorr has decided to call an authentication protocol. So using, so the first leap is that possession of discrete logarithm now can basically be used for authentication. So maybe that's, that's a deep idea that... Uh, that you know is obvious to you now, but maybe it's, it's very new in 1991. But looks, look at the protocol here. So the difference in this protocol is that this challenge is really now, it's not a one-bit challenge, it's a t-bit challenge. So that's, that's the protocol idea of this, of this particular approach. Uh, and unfortunately, what happens, basically, this is a very clean idea. Everybody can understand the proof of this now. You sort of, now it's called, uh, you know, two special soundness you have, and you can sort of understand how this entire scheme works very well. Uh, but what, what, uh, what happened next was, uh, so this, this paper, I think, was uh, in, uh, like, uh, somehow received in 1989. But um, the, uh, the filing of this patent right here, this is Schnorr's patent, uh, and it's filed in 1990, in February of 1990. And of course, it's exactly this same scheme. You send this uh, number, you select E, and then you basically send the response here. And that's, that's the first version. And Klaus uh, is basically smart enough 
to basically also claim not only essentially uh, Z star N, but groups of inverb rev residue classes, composite numbers, group of units, and an elliptic curve of finite field as a finite group. Uh, that's this last part right here is very, the 1990s elliptic curves, uh, they weren't like, not many people w were working with them. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I, my advisor was Sylvia. I don't think he was working with the elliptic curve groups at that time. Um, <clears throat> so that's it. 1990, uh, the, the, the patent is filed in 1990 and it's issued in 1991. And that basically cements this idea, this clean idea in, in a patent. Now what happens next, uh, I heard the story differently, but this person, David Kravitz, he actually patents uh, something else. Uh, so this this idea is really quite quite bizarre. So you, it's not even it's not clear why this works if you look at these equations. But essentially, if you take the diagram, you're, now it's uh, it's clearly a digital signature algorithm. So the idea of using the possession of a discrete logarithm as uh, authentication is 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 now you know fully codified as a, a signature algorithm, and this should look very familiar to anybody who's studied DSA or ECDSA. So, you, you know, you compute G to the K and then you compute this very bizarre term right here. And then the signature is this signature right here. And this was patented, right? This was filed 1991, right? Whereas this one was, so this is right within one year of essentially uh, Schnorr's patent is, uh, is this, this patent. Now, what happens next? This idea, this patent is basically granted gratis to the United States government. And NIST is basically given this patent. And NIST is also charged with coming up with the digital signature standard. And so that, that begins to happen right in 1991. And, uh, and indeed, uh, NIST basically s says, this is, the, this is the signature algorithm that America should use. And what happens? A bunch of people object. So in particular, and this, this is what I find in interesting. So Ron Rivest, who of course has his own digital signature algorithm, which also had a patent and was, was being sold by RSA, and, uh, and Martin Hellman, both of them wrote in CACM in essentially that next year. Uh, they, they, they said, we have responses to this NIST proposal. And, uh, and I, so I read all of these responses, several pages, and, uh, and summarized the complaints, right? So first of all, Ron really didn't like DSS. He says, you know what, it, it, all has, it also has patent problems. And he was saying that, in fact, Klaus, Klaus wrote a letter to NIST and said, my patent, which is this algorithm right here, okay, it covers... This algorithm too, That's, that was what his claim is. Now he never mentioned that, you know what, why isn't the prior art of Chom's protocol, why doesn't that invalidate all of these patents? He doesn't explain that, but that's what he wrote. And I think that objection went nowhere. Nobody believed that that patent was a problem. But you know what, Ron also said, DSS is too slow, especially for verification, um, which, is, which is interesting. And, uh, you know, he found a bunch of bugs. For example, the initial version of this thing didn't handle the case when S was zero. What, what does a verification algorithm do when S is zero and so forth? Um, and so, but these, these were very like nitpicks, right? These were not very serious bugs or serious complaints against the, the, the protocol. Here is what I thought uh, was a really interesting criticism of DSA, which is that there is risk of trap doors in the primes. Sharing global moduli is a risky thing. So think about that. Before DSA, something we're all familiar with, uh, the idea was RSA. So you pick your own prime modulus and everybody has a different one. So every, there's, there's, a, there's an aspect of uh, security to that. If, if you can pick the primes well, everybody has a different one. If you factor one prime, you don't break everybody's scheme. Whereas with this type of scheme, essentially you fix the group you fix the P, the generator, and so forth. Um, that's a very odd type of shift to make. So I thought that was a very interesting criticism. And of course, the other thing is that the scheme is new and untested. You know what is not a criticism that Ron Rivest brings up? Yes, John. There is no proof of security for this scheme. It is just sitting out there. That's not true. I mean... Uh, certainly later in the talk, I'll tell you something that absolutely has a proof 
and that we use. Okay, some check is an example. There was like, and of course, you know, GMR and GMW and like, there, there was a, certainly a robust era of, uh, you know, provable security at the time, you know. <clears throat> okay, so interesting though, Ron Rivest's criticism was not that this thing doesn't have a security proof or that nobody can understand why this works. In fact, if you look at all of those original papers, including something that I'm going to show you right now here, the next, so after all of this criticism, okay, uh, the criticism about DSS, Scott Vanstone, a mathematician, actually makes a very interesting observation. He's like, you know what? We can do exactly this same protocol just using elliptic curves. And this is actually how I think this all happened now. Because at this point, DSS really doesn't have an advantage over uh, RSA at the point. Why would you use this signature scheme that we don't understand why it's secure? And in particular, uh, it does seem to be slower in some particular, you know, sense. Uh, RSA signature verification is like you raise the number to a very small number, like 65,537, right? It's a very small number of multiplications you do to verify an RSA signature, whereas verifying this you'll see in a second, it does actually take quite a bit of effort. Um, and so, so certainly at this point, there was no advantage to DSS. However, in 1992, this elliptic curve formulation of exactly the same signature has all of the shortcomings, no, no security proof and so forth. However, it has a number of advantages. And, uh, okay, so in particular, uh, it's, it's a, as a cryptographer, I don't, most of us ignore this uh, signature, so we don't study it. It's not taught in introdu introductory crypto class because it has really nothing of insightful value. Like, you're doing all sorts of things that are bad. Like, for one, uh, you're interpreting, you're interpreting this element right here. So you, you compute this nonce, right? You pick a random K, just like with Schnorr. You compute this R, which is kind of the, the dangerous part. You need to make sure that K is different. This is another reason why this signature scheme is a little bit iffy. You again hash your message. And here, instead of having a linear function of this nonce and your secret key in the message, you just, you know, perturb it and, you know, put K in the denominator. And then in particular, you interpret R here. You interpret R, which is an elliptic curve point. You kind of map that into the scalar field, right? This is a scalar in terms of this thing. And so you kind of uh, just, in, you just cast this number, which maybe a programmer is happy to do casting one type to another. Mathematicians wondering what's going on here. I mean, maybe this works, but what, what's actually, what's the semantics of this? Why, you know, what, what's going on? None of this is understood, but in fact, this scheme, uh, it does work. In fact, uh, right around the same time here, uh, first Brown and then later Stern, Poincheval, Maloney, and Smart. So right around the time, it, so again, this thing was suggested in 1992. It's actually accepted as a standard for signature. The government accepts it in 1998 and ISO accepts it in 2000, etc. And then at that point, once it's a standard, then the process is maybe we should understand why this thing works at all. And in fact, if you look at this theorem statement from uh, essentially a combination, Serge has basically written this theorem statement as a combination of these two people right here. Uh, essentially, you, uh, you look at this, you look at the elliptic curve as a generic group, and then you make a generic group argument that, uh, that this works out. Okay, in the random oracle model and the generic group model. And, uh, and it's a very concrete bound here, um, essentially using a version of a forking lemma there, right? So at least we have some reason why this works. Now, why would one pick one signature scheme over the other? In fact, that's the whole point of the rest of my talk. Why do we pick the things we do? Why do we stick with things that are from the 1990s? And what do we do in response to them, right? Um, so here we go. I ran this this morning here uh, on, on, on my computer today. And uh, so around 2000, right, around 2000, this was the state of the world. You could, you, you have to, people are doing e-commerce. And so the cryptography is being used at this time. And RSA is taking about, uh, takes, you can do about 6,000 signatures and 90,000 verifications. And ECDSA, at the same time, you can do about 80,000 signatures, so 15 times more signatures, uh, but in fact, about one-fourth the number of verifications. Now, on the internet, which is the more dominant operation? Do we sign more or do we verify more? And who does what? What's your guess? Every server has to sign 
a message when it's doing like a TLS connection. Uh, so I would think you have to do more signatures than you have to do uh, verifications. Verifications are on the client side. Servers, I think, are the more. So um, in this sense, what I'm saying is that there's a clear and strong argument for ECDSA in this setting. So you can understand why at this point uh, people should be start using start using ECDSA because in fact at this point there is some sort of security argument. Uh, there is a tangible benefit to it. Not only is there speed a thing, more importantly, the signature size is important. So bandwidth wise, if that is if you are running a server, uh, then you're doing a TLS connection on many many operations, uh, and in fact this signature these are to scale by pixel, uh, like a 4,000 bits RSA versus a 256 bit uh, ECDSA. So there is a concrete reason to shift to ECDSA. Um, however, interestingly. This is Nick Sullivan, uh, who you know worked at Cloudflare, and he said, as late as 2012. So this is a decade now after 2000, a decade more, more than a decade. Uh, he did a he did a scan of the internet, downloaded every single TLS cert he could find on the internet, 13 million TLS certificates at the time, uh, and fewer than 50 using ECDSA. So everybody's still using RSA. Now again, you should ask yourself. Uh, you know, we don't, TVs don't last for 10 years and none of those entertainment. So, so many things in our life change so quickly, like the cell phone between this period in 2000, when almost nobody had one in 2012, when almost everybody had one, right? Many aspects of our life are changing, but why not crypto? Why not? Especially when there is a tangible reason uh, to shift, okay? And in fact, the how, how long does it take? So 2012, uh, 2021, I found another survey. This was F5, and they said essentially 24% after another 10 years. So first 10 years, there were exactly 50 of these certificates. And next 10 years, about 25% of the internet is using it. And now today, if you look at Let's Encrypt, Let's Encrypt by default only offers ECDSA now. And they offer about 500 million of uh, these certificates every year. And I don't know exactly what percentage of the internet, but I think the number has probably shifted to finally like, you know, in the high 90s or whatnot. What was my point with this? So the upgrade driven by performance, right? That was the only reason to use ECDSA. That whole story was there was a patent on the very clean thing. So someone came up with the hack thing. Uh, the hack thing actually stood the, st the test of time. Nobody has really broken it, and we do have some understanding of why it works. It's just not as clean a proof as we expect in crypto. But it, it is secure, uh, it is smaller, and it is faster for the important tasks. And yet, 20 years went by before it was basically adopted. Okay, so that is the phenomena that I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand it. And I'm trying to build some principles around it. And then I'm also trying to build a research agenda around that idea. And so I hope you push some feedback, uh, push, push back on my thesis here. Uh, but now I'm going to share how I interpret this, this idea, right? So essentially an upgrade that's only I've improved a signature by this much or that much, or it's like this much smaller, uh, that's going to be a very uh, completely uh, ineffective argument for changing how we do stuff, okay? For example, I give you the example. The curve 25519, okay? So Dan Bernstein and his co-authors, they write this paper in 2005. And at that time, see, they produce a signature. They find the right, a very good elliptic curve. And of course, they use the DSA, uh, like sorry, a Schnorr style uh, argument for the signature. And uh, they can do about 100,000 signatures per second. If you just look at what I did today, on ECDSA this morning, okay, uh, I'm I, I'm doing less than that on a server, on an AM, a single core of an AMD server. So his scheme in 2005 is, in fact, way better, okay. And there are some small advantages. The keys are exactly 32 bytes, and in fact, there's also some sort of uh, some sort of like weak argument that this is better for side channel analysis. That's no longer true, and in fact, there are these like complete addition chain addition. Uh, um, formulas for the t other type of elliptic curves and so forth. However, it is definitely faster and uh, definitely cleaner in terms of analysis. However, where is 25519 today? Everybody's heard of it. Everybody's probably used it. It's in OpenSSH, but look at this right here, the CA browser forum. This is what governs 
how the internet works. They, they specify how certificate authorities and browsers should operate. And all they do is say the only type of keys you can use are RSA and ECDSA. And in fact, these type of ECDSAs for the internet. So the whole internet will never use, uh, well, not never, but uh, there, there's no incentive to change to this particular thing. And in particular, I found this uh, nice little remark in GitHub, which is that, uh, so people are asking, hey, how come I can't use my favorite curve uh, with my Let's Encrypt? Why can't I get my favorite curve? Uh, you know, that's the certificate I want, and why can't I do that from Let's Encrypt? And this Let's Encrypt engineer basically says, you know what, there's no path towards pushing this right there. It's not gonna happen. Uh, it has some disadvantage because it's not a prime order curve. In fact, there is like, it is tricky to make sure that you pick the big group, not the small group, and there's a small group in there. Uh, NIST curves have good complete addition formulas. Essentially, he, he did the exact analysis that says, this thing might, might've been faster in 2005. It never picked up. It's not going to be selected by this CA browser form. And so we're, as Let's Encrypt, we're simply not going to do it. And this is a smart person. They could have made their own analysis that like, in fact, the uh, curve is better, so they should support it, um, but they don't. Let me give you a stronger argument for how this phenomena plays out. So that was a political thing. That was uh, a decision right here. Here is some physical, tangible, economic reason for why I think we're in that quagmire, how everything else can change, but crypto cannot. So here is the Android stack. It's a cartoon of how a modern Android phone works. You have a hardware layer, and in particular, I have this box right here, which is the secure element. So uh, almost all of the high-end phones that are Android have a secure element in, in there. And that's a, you know, that's, it's better than the TEE uh, because it's, it's hardened for, for, for key extraction at, at, a, at, a, at a hardware level. Then, of course, you have Linux. You have this hardware abstraction layer. You have the Android APIs, and then you have all the apps that use this type of thing. And now, naturally, the question is, what would it take to add new cryptography to this phone? It's not like we are asking someone to change the law of physics or that, you know, we're asking humans to have a 24th chromosome or anything like that. There's, this, is, this is a decision that a bunch of humans make about what crypto goes on this particular phone. And they're all very, very smart people who do this. Now, why are we stuck with what we have today? So I looked into that. And so, for example, Android right here has this thing called Strongbox, and that Strongbox is, in fact, uh, essentially right here. It is what uh, Android apps use to get access to this particular. It's, it's how apps can call down to that particular hardware. And this Strongbox, basically, it only supports, guess what, the things you expect, RSA, uh, ECDSA, and then a bunch of symmetric encryption schemes, okay? And in particular with ECDSA, it only actually supports that NIST 256 uh, version of it. That's what Android has supported. And in fact, uh, I've looked very hard into this, asking all the experts who build these phones, why can't we put new crypto? For example, pairing-based crypto. Why can't we put support for that uh, in this? Especially since Google controls Android, it's their thing. They can make the choice. Uh, and in fact, it is incredibly hard to change any of this. In particular, uh, this the API that so, so, so secure elements you can put, uh, you, you could write a special application and you can install it on a secure element without anybody's permission. You can do that if you're, if you're Google or if you're a device manufacturer. However, so Google could produce a next version of uh, crypto for this phone, um, but it would never get deployed because the hundreds of people that make this phone and the iOS phone, uh, they are not obligated to update any of the, this. so they're obligated to update this. If you sell Android, you have to basically agree that you update the Android operating system when new versions come out. However, you're not obligated to change any of that. So what does that mean? Uh, it basically will take a decade because if today, uh, everybody decided pairing-based crypto should be in these phones, then uh, Google could do it, and all of these layers could be changed, but everybody with the phone today wouldn't be able to, there would be no way for to force the people who support your phones today to upgrade and take that uh, to that thing. So all of the most compelling applications that, would, that you would do this for, you would never get to deploy. 
because essentially 90% of the people would not necessarily have access to that pairing based curve. And then how can you deploy a feature that uses that technology if it's not going to basically hit the whole market, right? So uh, somehow there's a level of interoperability. That's the, that's the crux of it. We are stuck with 1990s crypto because everything still has to work. And if some people have the old stuff, some people have the new stuff, you essentially have to revert to that lowest common denominator. And that's why we are stuck using the stuff that we have back there. Now, at what cost, right? So what, what is the downside of essentially sticking with ECDSA instead of, for example, using even Schnorr or ED25519, any of the new innovations in the last 20 years, what happens if we get stuck, okay? So I've compiled a list of what I think are the important features that new signature schemes have. So let's take a look. Now, of course, there's, there's performance, but I've already dismissed that. So curve is like slightly faster than all of these things, but that's never, if it's fast enough to work, nobody is ever going to upgrade for five or 10%. It's simply not a, a reasonable thing. But what about something like BLS? So that is one of the, uh, this new pairing style of curves that came around 2000s. Uh, they have a number of interesting features. So in fact, the first, so just a reminder, this is how the signature scheme works for these pairing based curves. So if you wanna sign a message M, you just hash it, you hash it to the curves. That's a little bit more complicated than it looks like. And then you just raise the secret key. Very, very simple to implement signature scheme, this BLS one. And to verify it, you just uh, basically check that the public key or the public keys G to the SK right here, uh, you can basically see why this pairing equation works because this right here will uh, basically have the SK on this side and this will have the SK on that side and they'll basically equal, right? Now, uh, the, the original BLS paper, if you read it, it says that the reason they wanted to introduce this trivial, this very simple signature scheme, they say it was a shorter signature. That was their main motivation, short signatures. And in fact, that's because this signature has one group element, which is 48 bytes, whereas the you know uh, ECDSA signature is 64 bytes. So it is in fact shorter, but it's not shorter in any meaningful way that makes some application possible that other application wouldn't be. And in fact, it has a 10x slowdown. So signing here takes about 370 microseconds versus about 35 for ECDSA. And verifying actually takes about 50 times more or 40 times more. So 70 microseconds versus 20. So it's very expensive to verify these signatures. So right away, there's no clear benefit from performance. And of course, like the size of signature is very trivial. Like this picture shows you, there's no reason to do that. Why though? Why would you think that BLS has any value then? So I credit Alexandra uh, Boldareva for pointing this out in 2003 paper. So she points out that this type of signature scheme actually has a number of, I love this paper of hers, it's underrated, uh, but she, this type of signature scheme actually has three interesting properties that no other previous signature scheme has together, okay? So first, uh, threshold. So everybody understands threshold crypto. The idea is that, uh, you know, you have some particular uh, signing key, but you'd like to split that signing key across several devices. And essentially you want to force those devices to come together and interact in order to produce a signature. You want to make sure that in particular, uh, no, if some, some, some of these devices get corrupted, then these, uh, these malicious parties cannot extract the secret key or sign a message without actually interacting with the honest parties, right? It's a very interesting concept for defense in depth. And that's, I think, in cryptocurrency is very important now, uh, you know, and also let's encrypt. We don't want single points of failure in our critical infrastructure. So there we go. Um, threshold. So Sasha observed that this scheme is actually very, very easy to thresholdize, right? So the signing message is, has a secret key right here. So you can just do a secret share of this SK and immediately thresholdize this scheme. So it's trivial to thresholdize. So that I think is a very, very interesting observation, but she goes on. She actually observes that uh, this signature scheme uh, is also multi-signature. So uh, suppose you have many signatures, like sig sigma one through sigma nine. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you wanna suppose, you, you wanna sign many messages. So this happens in blockchain protocols all the time. Uh, all the validators need to sign blocks and collect a quorum and so forth. Can you compress them? 
And in fact, there was a whole line of research about how to you know, do multi-signature bespoke schemes that only achieve that property. And this scheme is trivial because if you look at the equations, if you have a bunch of signatures on different messages under different public keys, you can just multiply them together. And essentially the, the, the verification uh, is just basically multiplying all of the individual verifications together. It all works because of this bilinearity. And that's a very interesting property. Um, when the special case that, like in blockchains, when you're talking about the same message, right? Then in fact, uh, you can, it becomes even simpler. In fact, you still only need two pairing operations and all of the rest of these operations are sort of pretty inexpensive group operations. So th this is a very interesting feature that uh, Sasha and then essentially uh, Benay, Manu and Gregory also uh, pointed out like uh, several years later that you can, you can uh, in the context of blockchains, there's a bunch of attacks, rogue key attacks and whatnot. You can defend against those in very clever, efficient ways as well. Finally, the blind signature. So here is a signature BLS that can also be trivially made into a blind signature. And this is essentially the same idea behind RSA blind signature. So what does Alice do if she, by the way, a blind signature is I would like to get a signature on a message such that the signer doesn't even know what the message is. And in fact, it's stronger than that, can't even track uh, can't even distinguish whether signing session was essentially message one or message two, um, and, and so forth. So very roughly, how does that protocol work? All uh, Alice has to do when she wants to blind the signatures is multiply it by this uh, blinding factor right here, and then, you know, send it over to Bob, the signer. Bob just signs it as before, which is essentially raises that message to his secret key, and then all uh, Alice does is basically unblind it by basically taking the public key and removing that blinding factor, right? Because essentially this is now G to the Rx. This factor is going to have a, this, this term right here is going to have an extra G to the Rx. So if the public key has G to the X, you can basically just subtract off the, the blinding factor R. Now this is secure under this very bizarre interactive assumption and whatnot, but yet here is a signature scheme that has three new features that ECDSA doesn't. A, you can easily thresholdize it. You can squash messages together, and that's very important because certificate chains, in fact, involve several signatures on different messages that you want to all check. So every browser in the world, when it goes to a website, has to check two or three signatures. This would be something useful for that. And finally, blind signatures are used for eCache. So <clears throat> my question, these are very, very compelling new features for a signature scheme, and yet BLS is also not adopted. And so why is that? So this is the famous, uh, this, is, this is how I think of why this is the case, right? So uh, although BLS can achieve these things, uh, the main point I want to give today is that, uh, in fact, ECDSA can also achieve this. And in fact, this is, I guess, the whole point of my talk, which is that I'll show you all three of these features are things that you can achieve with ECDSA. And, and so it goes back to the question of, are we shackled by legacy? Uh, there are some very like bizarre physical reasons why we're stuck with the crypto that was adopted at the beginning of the, the big bang of the internet, uh, essentially when signature schemes were picked. Uh, there were two or three that lived and essentially one that survives today, and that's the one that everybody uses, even blockchain uses. And uh, that, that's our shackle to legacy. And the question is, is that a... Uh, real weakness, or is that something that we can actually adopt by, you know, doing research into that? So I, I want to give you three examples. This uh, actually, Yash talked about uh, last uh, last year. Threshold ECDSA. There are many, many ways to thresholdize ECDSA. I'm going to, because I'm running out of time, sort of skip this. Right. The big idea is if you just rewrite the ECDSA signing using this like Barlon Beaver idea, and I think of it as the double Barlon Beaver trick. If you just kind of pick another phi, another secret nonce right here, and you multiply that nonce into the right spot, essentially they'll cancel each other out while maintaining the secrecy that you need. And um, we have a pretty good framework in our paper last year uh, to essentially understand how this works. Uh, this is a framework for building threshold e ECDSA from any type of multiplier, both the PIA style as well as OT style. And uh, essentially, the new idea is how we verify consistency for this special kind of object. The whole point, forgetting about how it works, uh, the whole point of this, uh, I'm going to quickly skip that, is that in fact it's quite performant. So uh, for all of the tasks that you would need threshold signing for, for example, doing smart contracts, uh, si you know, sending 
sending transactions to blockchains or using using uh, essentially identity uh, signatures for uh, you know contracts or real world physical identity and you want to basically have avoid a single point of failure um, our protocols are quite performant so you can sign in milliseconds uh, two three four and you can even scale to several hundred party signatures essentially in uh, in reasonable time frames and 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 so and if, and of course we can also look at essentially the um, we can look at the um, the bandwidth requirements as well, and those are all feasible for all the type of applications you want to do. For example, let's encrypt. It's conceivable they can use this in order to essentially issue, even though they issue millions of signatures at scale. Um, but let me move on here. So this is a new piece of work, work in progress uh, with Yash and with uh, some other of my students. Um, so it's not exactly tight. But there is an idea that you can actually do blind ECDSA using the same sort of techniques that we use for threshold ECDSA. So what's the, what's the big problem? Everybody looks at this equation for ECDSA and essentially thinks about it and it's, it's, it's not clear how to make an MPC for this, uh, an efficient MPC for making this signature blind. What do you have to do to make a blind signature? You want a protocol that allows Alice to recover this R and S on a particular message uh, Bob shouldn't learn the message, and Bob shouldn't learn anything about R and S. Right? So just to give you a little bit of a hint of how that can work, it's actually just three steps and three tools that you can put together, and it's glued together by the same techniques that glued the threshold ECDSA together. Uh, so the first idea is that in order to pick this nonce, you have a few things to avoid. You can't just let Alice pick the nonce, because then Alice could pick the same nonce twice, and ECDSA has this very nasty problem that the Sony people learned about, which is that if you sign with the same nonce twice, you can easily extract the, the whole signing key. So you can't just let Alice pick the nonce. You can't just let Bob pick the nonce, because if Bob picked the nonce, uh, Bob would be able to track this signature, wouldn't be blind anymore. So you have to have them both collaboratively pick this, uh, this particular point. Uh, so you can basically do a very simple additive version of this. Uh, and and you can force Alice in to ensure that uh, Alice doesn't grind on this by essentially making making her commit to to her particular thing. So that that's the very simple step. It gets a little bit more complicated in the next one, which is that uh, you need to show uh, Alice needs to show that uh, essentially she knows the pre-image of this particular uh, you know thing that she's about to get signed. So you can use some sort of garbled version of a protocol for that part, sort of. Uh, the previous Avishai just discussed how that's like much, much more practical and fast uh, than, than you think, even though it has some bandwidth requirements. And the final step, and this is the tricky part, uh, you have a number of constraints. So uh, Alice's input is E and Rx, because of course Bob can't know Rx. Uh, it's very important that this Rx be exactly the point that was uh, basically agreed upon in this. You, you gotta make sure that Alice doesn't just use any input that she wants. Um, Bob's input is this SK, and then this purple input is shared. So essentially you have three classes of inputs, uh, whereas previously in the threshold you only had two classes of inputs, essentially uh, ones that were all Alice's, ones that were, uh, that were all Bob's. Um, and so yes, it's a little bit trickier to ensure that um, in all of these multiplications the, the, the multiplication happens consistently, but in fact it follows from, a sen from, from similar arguments. And the estimated performance is feasible. So at least we, ha we haven't finished that, but it does feel like it's, uh, it's on the order of less than a second in the order of hundreds of milliseconds. I, I also want to talk about, so that's blind signatures. You can do, bl surprisingly, you can do threshold, surprisingly, you can do blind, and surprisingly, this is, as far as I can tell, was an open problem for a long time. How can you aggregate ECDSA signatures? And it's not clear this is possible. If you look around, uh, essentially many of the blockchain people have looked at this, like for example, this author tried to do this using Nova, okay? And uh, it's, I consider this a big failure. So it's an interesting experiment that Nova can be used for. Nova is a recursive uh, uh, ZK-SNARK system. And uh, I consider it very interesting because in fact they do build a way to verify like, you know, in this case, always 300 signatures. So 30 times 10 or 15 times 20, these are different parameters for Nova. But look at the performance that you get. Essentially, you can verify on the order of tens of signatures per second, whereas if you just use brute force, you can do 26,000. So I'm out of time, but I do want to basically mention that the other idea from the 1990s that has very relevance is essentially this uh, LF 
LFKN paper, and uh, it's a sum check idea. And uh, it's a very interesting protocol that allows a prover to convince a verifier of this very big equation. You can use it, uh, essentially, we, we do this in this paper of mine from 2017. Uh, building on that paper, I'm going to skip over this, we can uh, essentially observe that if you have some check and a vector commitment, you can get a snark. And using that kind of snark, you can do this type of multi-signature with ECDSA. So <clears throat> what does this show you? Essentially, right about, right about here, at this, at this level right here, which is unfortunately around 2,000 ECDSA signatures, uh, you actually get faster verification than if you just use brute force. So this right here is the brute force line. If you just use the world's fastest ECDSA verifier and verify, you know, it's obviously linear. Uh, and this right here is essentially using a, um, a square root uh, snark. And, uh, and they cross over, obviously. And, and thus, you know, it's, it shows a preliminary result that's possible to do something like ECDSA. Um, and why does it work? It's, you know, for a very specific mathematical relationship. I was going to basically end by saying that there's one other signature that I wanted to talk about, which was this BBS plus. It allows you to do essentially zero knowledge proofs about signatures. And skipping to the point is that you can take the same approach that uh, we just used, adding a new idea, and you can basically prove very complicated statements about ECDSA signatures. And those have applications in, for example, uh, latest thing is mobile driver's licenses. So uh, let me just wrap up here. Thank you for your attention here. But where should we go from here? So what, what, what did I want to say? Um, I think if you're going to build a new signature scheme, it better have a really strong motivation. Can't be performance. It can't be some of these features which legacy schemes can also support. Uh, to me, the most interesting thing is post-quantum security. And uh, this, these, this is dilithium two, and you can sort of see that essentially, although the signature is bigger, they're not too big for practice, and in fact, they're really quite fast. In fact, uh, <clears throat> almost as fast, or in one case, faster than essentially the fastest elliptic curve signatures. And and so, I think the right agenda is to consider this has been standardized. It was not; none of these ideas were basically considered when it was standardized. And so again, an interesting research agenda is how can you add, uh, if you consider now dilithium legacy, how can you add these particular features to, uh, to lattice-based signatures? And I think those are interesting research problems. Uh, it's how, what was my point? Coordination seems to be way more expensive a resource than anything that computer scientists measure when they measure their schemes. Crypto performance is really not that relevant if it's, you know, essentially feasible. And the shackles of legacy may still inspire you to, like it has for me, to consider new and interesting problems. But that's what I wanted to say. I would love to hear your pushback if you think this is going in the wrong way. Thank you. Well, good. Nobody's pushing back, so. I, I have some question, actually. So I think what you alluded to is uh, it's a general thing where there are dependencies. So it takes a generation to, to basically overcome those dependencies. And maybe to, to your diagram with the Android stack, yeah. a question that, that would be interesting that, that I'm not sure like how, uh, like how deeply has been thought through, but is it is there a way to potentially generalize some of the aspects such that more schemes would be possible before it has to be uh, completely phased out um, and and upgraded? Like, is there a way to generalize the the schemes that are uh, enabled? Yeah, in, in that bottom layer. So this right here. So NXP. That's a company that's been around a long time. They do these hardened implementations of these algorithms. They make sure that they don't have side channels and power channels and whatnot. Uh, and indeed, I think they're, they, can, they can easily take any crypto algorithm we, we basically put forth and uh, implement it and put it on there. And I'm sure they wouldn't even charge more than $10 million to do it, which 
I'm sure that many people could afford if they wanted to. Um, but will they? Like, will they do that for pairing-based crypto? I'm not sure. I mean, right now, I think probably not. They should probably skip it. They should probably go straight to spending their time uh, taking one of the lattice-based signatures and supporting those. That's, again, my opinion. No market motivation, essentially. Yeah, I don't know. No academic motivation either. Okay, so, so another... I guess I would say pairing-based crypto is effectively dead, at least for signatures. Maybe Groth16 is the one application. We don't know how to achieve that. Uh, but even with that, you can do with... I think there are lattice-based... There's a recent lattice-based construction that also has, uh, you know, um, constant size proof in that setup model. Yeah, thanks for the really great talk. It was worth coming to Singapore just to hear that. So that was really uh, <laughs> great. I, I mean, I I, um, uh, I I actually just want to make an observation. I mean, I couldn't quite tell your point. Like at first, you said you know it sounded like you were you were saying we should get rid of these shackles, but that, then you said we should work within them, and and that's great. Well, okay, so I'm not sure, but but anyway, but <laughs> I had to be I had no, to no, like it's fine. Hide it's fine. it a little bit. Uh, the only thing I, I kind of was was thinking about as I'm as I'm thinking about this is like the perspective of the, of us in this room is different from 99.99% .99 of humanity, right? So the average person on the internet doesn't care about threshold or multi-sig or anything else. 20% performance improvement by moving from one curve to another, I don't think most people care about that either. So like, you know, changing from a VCR to, to streaming, it, it, the, the world cares about that, right? This other stuff, I think only people in this room and people like us care about. Well, the people who design Android should care about it, right? Because that's essentially 20%. I'm not sure. 20 you know, of... like, what, what, you mean 20% gain on the signature? I, I don't know. Because there's a cost to switching, right? There's a cost yeah. to switching over and all that. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's lots of interesting points here. I mean, we can discuss why pairing-based crypto never took off. Why didn't NIST ever standardize it? Uh, you know, we can speculate. Um, but anyway, that, that was the only observation I wanted to make. I think we have, we're done with the questions. We can take any more questions outside. All right. Uh, thank you. Okay. Th thanks, Professor Abi.